You're watching Ramping Up Your English. This is segment two of episode 58. We're still in Africa, learning about humankind's closest relative in the animal world, chimpanzees. They share so much DNA with humans that it's easy for us to see ourselves in them. Now, does that mean that chimps have intelligent thoughts and emotions like we do? Researcher Jane Goodall has studied chimpanzees in Africa for many years. Writer Virginia Morell got to see Goodall work with the chimps in Tanzania. She shares her insights into the animals in a book entitled Animal Wise, appearing on the RTV program Life Passages with host Nancy Bloom. Morell says her work around animal intelligence and emotion began when she observed her dog. It started with actually watching my own dog. I think a lot of people who own pets, they watch them and they think that their animals have, got, have thoughts and emotions and are responding to them. But it, 20, 30 years ago, we were told that we were just sentimentalizing, that the animals really didn't have thoughts of their own. They were just reacting to stimulus. Mm -hmm. So um, I watched our dog, Quincy. She was a mixed collie, and she invented various games. And I thought, it's remarkable. She has an imagination. And you see that, mm -hmm. too, when your dogs dream. You think there's something going on in their minds, or just how they look at you and study you. And then I had a, a wonderful trip that I made to uh, East Africa, to Tanzania, to meet with Jane Goodall and mm. to interview her about Louis Leakey, who had started her on her research there. Mm -hmm. So. While I was there with Jane, we watched the chimpanzees together. And, and I, let's pull up a photo of that. Sure. There she yeah, is. There with, she is. Yeah, with the That chimpanzee. was when I was with uh, Jane at Gombe National Park oh. in Tanzania. It was uh, a fabulous experience, obviously, to first be meeting with Jane Goodall and then to be watching Jane Goodall watching the chimpanzees. So, uh, of course, we saw a number of behaviors there that made one really question what was going on in the mind of the chimpanzee. Right. In one particular incident, this older chimpanzee was caring for an orphan chimp. And we watched uh, as Jane had given him a big bunch of bananas, which we had thought he would share with the little orphan Dilly. But he didn't. He sat down. And <laughs> I know it was really something to watch this big, beefy guy just sit there and eat about 30 bananas all by himself, and little Dilly was sitting there looking sadder and sadder and more deflated. And so afterwards, he fell on his back and was snoring. The going big chimp that ate all the Yeah, Beethoven sound asleep, snoring. Dilly was grooming him. And Jane was standing in the shed next to where this little drama was unfolding, and she'd held back one banana because she thought Beethoven might pull that stunt. And she held the banana up so Dilly could see it, and she and Dilly made eye contact. And it was as if a thought passed between mm -hmm. the two of them. And normally a chimpanzee, when they see food, they make a food cry. Mm. And so that was what Beethoven had done when he mm -hmm. saw the bananas. He made mm -hmm. this hoo-hoo-hoo sound. But uh, Dilly didn't make a peep. She was so mm. smart enough to not, not make a sound. And so that you'd say, okay, the banana is a stimulus, she should make the response of a food cry. But she is a thinking animal, and she didn't. Mm -hmm. And so she watched as Jane put the banana behind the shed, out of sight of Beethoven, and little Dilly very quietly tiptoed over there, got the banana, ate it in about two bites, and then tiptoed back to Beethoven, making these very soft contentment sounds. <laughs> <laughs> so I was amazed by that, and I said to Jane afterwards, I said, that was truly remarkable, and aren't you going to write that up for a scientific journal about how this young chimpanzee, you know, sort of plotted with you and deceived Beethoven? And she said, oh, I, I absolutely can't. Why? This, this was in 1985. I mean, it's really not that long ago. And she, and she said, well, if I do, people will accuse me of anthropomorphizing. I see. I can't possibly say that Dilly deceived Beethoven uh -huh. or that Dilly plotted with me. I can only say if Dilly were a human, we would say yes. she did X, Y, Z, because it's intentional behavior right. rather than stimulus response. Right. It actually requires thinking. Right. And at that time, scientists were really prohibited by the way that the science of animal behavior had come about from actually saying that animals did things with purpose or intention. It was only that, you know, you, know, you sort of hit them on the knee and they 
responded. It wasn't, didn't require any brain power. So, but she told me, she said, and she, Jane was very wise and smart. She is a very wise woman. She said, but the field is changing. Mm, she could feel it already. She knew that it was changing. And so she said, in time, it's going to be very different. And I thought that would be my next book. That was 1985. Oh, even then you thought even, that? Yes, I thought that's a transition that I want to uh, watch and chronicle. And so when I finished the book, then I began to work on articles that were about animal behavior and animal cognition research and eventually uh, received an assignment from National Geographic magazine to write a story about that subject. Mm -hmm. That was in 2006. And I think maybe there's a photo related to that. There is. <laughs> and we can ask yeah. for that to come up. Yeah. There is, I think, the cover shot of, yes, yes there, it, there is. it is. Inside Animal Minds. That was my night. Uh, it came out in March 2008. It was a cover story for National Geographic. And it was hugely popular. I think partly because of the lovely photograph of Betsy the Border Collie yes. <laughs> on the cover. Now, was that your dog? No, no, that was the dog in Austria, and she's a very smart dog, and she's one of these dogs that the owners, just as a game, because uh, Betsy was really attuned to words and so forth, and they had as a game, they had taught her how each toy had a different name. She had about 350 toys. Mm each one with a different name, and you could put all her toys out there and tell her to go get, uh, like, the hamburger, and which was, of course, a rubberized-looking mm. ha chew toy hamburger, and, and Betsy would go, and out of all of her other toys, she would get that one. So this brings up an important question. Do animals think in the sense that people think, and do they feel emotions? And how would we know the answer to either question? Well, what we've learned about chimpanzees, largely through Jane Goodall's work, forces us to confront these questions. Any idea of animal intelligence was once dismissed with, well, only man can use tools. Well, now we know that chimpanzees make and use tools for various functions. And what about emotions? Do our pets simply mimic the emotions we have? Or do animals actually have emotions of their own? Well, we all have our opinions about that. But what about proof established by scientific inquiry and observation? Researcher Gay Bradshaw studies animals from a perspective of a neuropsychologist. Her research focused on a mysterious mass killings of rhinoceros. Investigators found the killers were young male elephants. But why? Nothing like this had ever been reported, and it was totally out of character with what we know about elephants. Dr. Bradshaw says that the answer to this mystery was found in what these young elephants witnessed and how they were removed from the support system that naturally exists within a group of elephants. Well, it turns out that these young teens um, young bulls had been orphaned during a cull when there had been mass killing. So they, they witnessed their mothers killed and their families killed, then, which is very traumatic. Then they were taken away um, when they were probably like two or three years old, and they were brought translocated to a different area where there was not that same traditional structure of the natal family of a mother and aunties and other babies. So they were really forced to grow up on their own. Then they didn't uh, experience that second phase of socialization with the other bulls. Now it's more than just structure. When you look at what's happening in the brain and the mind, as we see in post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, you actually see that the, the patterns, the processes in the brain are shaped by the experiences. So when the bulls, these young bulls were killing the rhinos, it was really um, diagnosable as a trauma, as, a, as PTSD, just as we might diagnose someone who has experienced severe trauma, whether they're a veteran or whether it's domestic violence or some kind of other accident. Brad Shaw explains the social system among elephants that these young bulls were denied due to the killings they experienced and the isolation they experienced. For, for one thing, they are organized in many different sort of levels of society. So the fundamental unit is the family, 
and there's a matriarch with other aunties and, and babies. And that's the fundamental unit. And the babies are born, and they stay within that natal, they call it the natal family, until they're about 10 years old. Then the, the young males, the boys, are going off to a second phase of socialization with the all-bull group or all-bull area. The females stay within the natal herd. So these are two very, it's very structured, very much like traditional humans' cultures and societies. So they're very structured. And those themselves, those units or those organizational patterns are repeated at different levels. So you can see layer upon layer upon layer of this very complex society where it's sort of like a very, very intricate web of relationships. And those relationships translate to what is happening and how the brain and the mind are formed. Elephants suffering post-traumatic stress disorder may seem far-fetched to some, but it does help explain the mysterious behavior and the importance of a social animal's support system. And how could an animal suffer this disorder if they don't experience emotions? Bradshaw documents the damage humans do when they remove social animals from their social groups, animals like parrots. Parrots and are very similar to the elephants. They have extremely strong um, bonds and fidelity to relationship and um, they're flighted, that's the other thing. And yet we as a culture are conditioned to see uh, an animal in a cage as something normative, as something that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. So really we need to start looking through um, the, our own eyes of how, what we would feel like in those conditions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bradshaw has established an organization called the Curulose Foundation to dissimulate her scientific findings and to foster education about the well-being of animals. Non-human animals have the capacities and the vulnerabilities that we do psychologically and emotionally. So our first few years were really, really articulating a very solid scientific foundation. And then we've shifted into education and sanctuary. So we have a couple of programs that are what we call Educate to Action. So they're learning about animal minds, animal experience, um, trauma recovery. But then they're linked to learning, which we feel very, is very important it's philosophically, is taking what you learn and applying it to very concrete situations. So we partner with people around the world. Um, our students take the courses, and then they actually put their work um, into conservation or animal protection. And that's a really important thing. It's a very empowering thing, too, because, as you talked about, the world is changing very fast. So what we really need to do is to build capacity to care for, basically, animal refugees, uh, parrots who are abandoned, um, uh, tortoises, um, cats and dogs. And so a lot of our programs are really trying to help build capacity, social capacity, to care for these individuals in need. Dr. Gay Bradshaw made her comments on an RVTV program entitled Animal Matters, produced and directed by Wanda Borland. Her area of expertise is neuropsychology and transspecies psychology.